Hebrews chapter 12. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like you needed to establish something with somebody? Or establish something, period, in your own life? Now, I'll give you an illustration of that with our kids. Men, we want to establish with our kids that we are not afraid, that we are brave, right? So there's those opportunities when something weird happens, there's a noise in the house, and everybody like, oh, and even the man might be like, I don't even want to go see what that was, right? But because we want our kids to know that we're brave, we have to establish the fact that we're not afraid we muster up the energy and we go check out whatever it is because we need to establish to our children the importance that their father is an anchor in the home. Now, I don't know what kind of things you've had to establish. Maybe you've had to establish uh, in a job. You've had to establish yourself in a way that other people showed you the respect that was due you to the fact that maybe you had knowledge in a given area that Nobody knew you had knowledge in, and so over the course of time, you had to establish your reputation to be known, to understand what, what your job was. I don't know what it is that you've had to establish in your life, but every one of us, every one of us, there's not a person in this room who doesn't have to establish something. Do you know that you are establishing every day, you're establishing a reputation? Did you know that? You're establishing your character. As a believer, you're establishing your witness, whether you're doing it intentionally or non-intentionally. Unfortunately, if you're doing it non-intentionally, you might not be establishing a very good reputation. You might not be establishing a very good witness if you're not doing it intentionally. But we all are establishing in life. I want you to look here in Hebrews chapter 11 for the for, not fur, how do you spell fur? We all do that, right? For, oh, for the life of me, I, you know, it's not fur, it's for, right? F-O-R, for, for, excuse me, my ADD just went off, all right? I apologize. You with me? You back? I'm not. I'll be here in a minute, all right? Hebrews chapter 12, what we've been talking about for the last couple times that I've preached is in this area of what if. What if. The song that they sang right before I preached, is the song, What If? What If? What If? In the first message, I talked about Job. You remember that? Talked about Job and how that Job, there came a point in a time where Job, he was a man who was really rich, had a lot of things going for him, and Satan went to God and said, um, actually, Satan was around God, and God said, hey, look at Job. He's a man, a righteous man. I love him. He's doing great. Uh, he was given a, an old... Uh, you the boy, to Job, to the devil, telling the devil about how proud he was of Job. And, and the devil looked at God and said, yeah, the only reason he's doing all that is look at all the things you're doing for him, all the many uh, blessings you've given him, the, the possessions he has. Man, if, if I had those, I mean, anybody to have those would naturally serve you. And God said, no, that's not the reason Job serves me. He serves me because he loves me. Satan said, that's not true. God said, all right, I'll give you the opportunity to prove it to be true. You can take everything Job has except his life. You can't take his life, but I'll let you take everything he has, and I'll prove to you, I'll establish to you, Satan, that Job is true and that he is who he says he is. So Satan had a field day. He took his field, he took his crops, he took his, uh, his uh, livestock, he took his family, all of his children died, their wives died. Satan took everything from Job, and then he took his help from him. And Job sat outside the gates of his house, and, and the dogs came and licked his wounds. He was so sick, and he had lost everything he had, including his health. And his wife came out the door one day, and she looked at Job, and she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And pretty well what Job said to him, uh, to her, is he simply said this, even if, it's not what if, but even if is the title of the, of the song. Even if, even if God were to kill me, I'm not going to curse God and die. Even if. 
Then the second message I preached was out of Hebrews chapter 12. And it's talking about how that we are runners and we are to run the race and we're to be diligent to run the race. Even if it's hard, even if it's not easy, we're to run that race. So we're going to launch from that this morning in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all right, and I, I'll be going to three in a minute, but I'm just giving you, uh, I'm kind of bringing you up to speed to last week's message. Since we are surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's what I want you to understand. There is a race that's set before us. There are those who have began the race ahead of us. And if you remember when I preached this message two weeks ago, I said this race was not a sprint. You remember that? It's not a sprint. A sprint is when you're in competition with somebody. Do you know a lot of churches do that, right? Maybe you've been to one where it feels like everybody's in competition against each other. Everybody's trying to prove they're better than somebody else. That they got it more together than somebody else has it. This is not a sprint race that we're in. This is more along the lines of a marathon. It's a marathon. And a marathon is a long run. It's not something It's a short run. It's a long run. But not only is it a marathon, don't miss this, it is a relay. Now, some of you, I asked you a couple weeks ago, how many of you have ran a relay race before? A relay race is just simply one where there is a baton involved. And you have several people that are involved in the race, and they stand at different points on the race track, and the first runner runs with a baton, he gives all he has, and then he comes up to the second runner, and the second runner starts running, and as they're running, he hands off the baton to the next runner, and the next runner takes the baton and runs with it. And they continue to do that from person to person in a relay race until the finish line's crossed. That's the race it's talking about. We are in a race in conjunction with each other, not in competition with one another. We're here to be a part of passing the baton, of help getting that around the course to make this race work. And to do all, and the baton is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have the baton, and we are to run with the baton. And why is that important? Remember the very first word in chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1? What's that first word? word can somebody do you have it or do you have it there i don't have it on screen but do you have it there do you have it turned there what is it therefore therefore now the word therefore when you see that word you should always ask yourself the question what why is it therefore <laughs> okay simple thing to remember when you see the word therefore always ask yourself why is that therefore here's a reason it is a conjunction word, which means I want to remind you of what I just said, and based on what I just said, now I'm going to tell you this. That's why it's there for. So what is he saying? There are those who have ran the race. Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about it's the hall of faith or the wall of faith, and it lists a, a name of all the men and women, or not all, but a lot of the men and women of faith. And God is showing us how they continued faithful in the faith. And so he's saying, there are those who have ran before you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, what does this witnesses mean? I've had people, and I've probably been guilty of saying it myself, and I said this a couple weeks ago, is I've been guilty of saying, you know, that there are those in heaven that are watching down over us and, and you know, seeing us run. I don't know that scripture ever says that. I don't know that it says that. It does say that angels are around us, and no doubt we have heavenly hosts that are around us, but saints that have died and have gone on to heaven, I don't know if there's anything in scripture that tells us that they're watching down on us. We don't need them to watch down on us. God has given us his holy angels to compass around us and to protect us and to do the things that need to be done. Okay, it sounds good at a funeral. I'm going to be honest with you. There's been a lot of funerals where I've heard people say, oh yeah, this person's now watching down on you. And it's a nice little thing to say, but at the end of the day, I can't find in Scripture where the Scripture says that people who have passed on are watching down on us. 
But here's what this passage is talking about. What it's talking about is that we have the witness of the testimony of the saints who have gone before us that surrounds us or encompasses us as an example of us running the race. And that we run this race and we be faithful to it. And they have run ahead of us or run behind, and they've come to the point now that they've handed off the baton, and now we take the baton, and we're to run with it. So therefore, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance. What's the next two words there? Does anybody have that? The race. The race that is set before us. And then the first Two, uh, first three words in verse number two, listen to it. It says, looking to Jesus. So when I run the race, I'm to look to Jesus. I used an illustration a couple weeks ago about police officers on the side of the road that get hit by cars. You've seen some of that, right? Caught on, caught on video or whatever, you know. And you think, are people doing that on purpose? I mean, is that just being malicious and hitting a police officer on the side of the road? I really don't believe that's true. I'm not saying it couldn't be true that there's maybe somebody that's like that. But I think ultimately it is an accident that happens. And you know how it happens? They're driving down the road. They see the police officer and they're like, oh my goodness, what's going on there? And whatever you're looking at is where your car is going to go. Do you realize that? So if you're staring at this event going on, that's how wrecks happen. When a wreck happens, that's how more wrecks happen because a lot of people are so busy looking at the wreck, they're not paying attention to the road. And another wreck happens. And a police officer gets hit. And do you realize it's the same way when we're running the race that God's called us to run, that if we're not looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, if we get our eyes off of him, we start veering off the race trail that God's called us to run on. Just like a bike, right? Uh, Ricardo, if you're on a bike and you're riding a bike and you're just constantly looking somewhere than where you're supposed to go, ain't going to turn out well, is it? It's going to get bad. Because you have to be uber-focused on where you're going and what you're doing. And so it's a race that we have to run, looking to Jesus. Then it goes on to verse 3. Look at it. It says, consider him. Who's him? Jesus. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus did, but we haven't. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. And he goes on in verse 7. It is for discipline that you have endured. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, I want to stop for just a minute again, and I made emphasis of this, and I don't want you to lose track of the context of the passage we're reading about. What are we reading about? What is this all about? Forget what I just read. What was the first part of what I was saying? That this is all about running what? Running a race. Don't lose sight of that. This is not about now rearing a child as far as like forget the race. Now we're talking about raising children. As though those are two different thoughts. They're in conjunction with each other. Don't miss this. The discipline that he's talking about here is not like discipline where a parent would spank their child. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a race. And in that race, we have to realize, just like when I used to weight lift years ago, and I'd have a spotter, and I'd get down on the weight bench and I'd be pumping the iron. And I'd have somebody at the head of me here because there comes a point where you go, and it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> right? And you're like, ah! 
and you're giving it all you got. And they're standing over you going, you can do it. Go, push, 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 push. You know what they're doing? They're disciplining me to do what I need to do to get it done. They're not standing over me with a belt and hitting me and smacking me. Listen, when we live life constantly thinking about all the wrong our kids have done and that's all we focus on is, oh yeah, i got to discipline you. For How about we discipline them to do good things rather than always thinking about disciplining them for doing all the wrong things? God is not about... He's not in heaven with a two-by-four ready to whack you every time you do something. That's not the discipline it's talking about. God is a trainer who is training you to establish what he's put in you. And so he's, he's disciplining you to do what you need to do. When you go to the gym, you have to discipline yourself. If you go to the gym to lift or run or do whatever you do, you've got to discipline yourself to, to work hard, don't you? Now, if you have a trainer, you're going to have somebody else do all the heavy lifting when it comes to, to pushing you and, and shoving on you. But when you don't have a trainer, you got to push yourself. And sometimes you push yourself beyond the limits of things you just don't think you can do, but you, you work at it anyway, right? It's discipline. It's discipline. Don't miss this. God is disciplining you to be everything he wants you to be, to establish in you what he's put in you. That's amazing. Isn't that cool? I've had people say, oh, pastor, you know, I don't like all the hardship that seems like it comes on me. God just won't let up. No, God is a trainer. He doesn't let up. He sees what's in you, and he's going to push you to, to, to bring out what is in you. He wants it to be mature and strong. He don't want you to wimp out on him. I've seen it happen. I've been raised in church all my life, and I've watched people who come to church, and somebody says something cross to them, or they say something to them that they don't like, or they get their feelings hurt. Well, I'm not going back to that church again. I can't believe that person. Blah, 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 blah. Right? It's like, you know, pull up your big boy pants. Let's go. This, this is a... This is, Oftentimes there's discipline that's involved. We've got to be disciplined to stay focused because when we quit looking at Jesus and we start looking at people that hurt us and people that offend us and people, then we've got our eyes off the prize, which is Christ Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. When I remember him and I look to him, then I can put up with a lot of the other junk that goes on around me. But when I lose sight of him, then I start being frustrated and mad and hurt and I start letting my eyes get caught on people and now people are manipulating me and people are controlling me and people are are maneuvering my emotions around where God can settle me because the joy of the Lord is my strength and when I allow my vision to be caught on him he becomes my strength doesn't mean that everything gets easy it just means I've, I've gained focus on the right thing and I want you to understand today that here in this passage, God is simply telling us not to grow weary when he reproves us, when he disciplines us. It goes on to say there in verse number 7, it is for discipline that you, that you have to endure. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Well, I don't like going to the gym. Because when I go to the gym, all that does is it... It causes me a lot of grief and a lot of pain, and I start sweating, and I get all, and I have to take a shower afterwards, and I don't like that. That discipline is just more than I care to have to do, deal with. But look at the results of what you get after you've disciplined yourself well. You'll walk away feeling better about yourself. You feel, you feel more alive, right? You have to look beyond the discipline. It's only through the discipline that you're going to become who God wants you to be. You're going to be established through the discipline and because of the discipline. And he goes on to say here, in verse number 8, if you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have 
uh, had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirit and spirits and live? Look at verse number 11 now. Get this in verse number 11. For the moment all, uh, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Amen and amen. <laughs> Betty and I on our trip had a great time. We fly on standby. When you fly on standby, you're pretty much guaranteed not to set together most times. It can happen, but a lot of times you don't set together. We got set together the whole flight. I mean, the whole time we were on our trip, we got set together, except for the very last flight. Very last flight, we get to Detroit, and we found a flight where we could actually get out a little earlier. So we got on that flight, and praise the Lord, even on standby, we got on a flight, it worked out really well. We we're so excited, got on a plane, took off, and here we are flying along. Kid you not, got almost to Indianapolis. And the pilot comes over the intercom and says, I'm sure you might have noticed we took a heavy turn. Um, we're having to return back to Detroit Airport because we have some landing gear issues. Um, and uh, um, so we need to return back to Detroit. So they come off the intercom. Betty and I are like, what? I mean, how could that be? I mean, like, they can fix it in Evansville. We've got to land. We're almost to Evansville. Why go back to Detroit? So we're debating on all this, trying to figure it all out. But needless to say, we return back to Detroit. Plane lands fine. Betty talks to one of the pilots, find out what was going on. Actually, what had happened is the pilot and co-pilot have instrument panels, and the instrument panel for the pilot had gone out. So he couldn't really read his, his stuff to land the plane, but the co-pilots was fine, and it worked fine. But they didn't have the right equipment to fix it in Evansville. So they needed to return to Detroit in order they get this plane fixed right away and I guess keep it back in service or whatever. So uh, we landed fine, got off the plane. They said, we'll be getting you on another plane. So we had to wait just a little bit. And they said, okay, we got you another plane. Everybody going to get your same seats. So we get back on the plane, same seats. We're sitting there and we're waiting. And, and we happen to notice this maintenance van pulls up beside the plane. A guy gets out and comes up onto the plane and course you know anybody that works at the airport say that's not normal <laughs> something not right about that you know and somebody's like what's that about and so this goes on for about 15 20 minutes and then finally a pilot comes out of the cockpit and he says folks I'm so sorry I'm just as weary with this as you are but we have an issue with this plane we're gonna have to deboard and we're gonna have to find another plane uh, there's a light on the tail of the plane that when they flipped the switch, it wasn't going out. And I'm glad they're picky, you know. My life depends on them being picky about these planes, right? But it wouldn't, it wouldn't go off when they flipped the switch, and so they had to deboard the plane. Finally, we got on another plane, and in the middle of all that, somebody found out it was our 29th wedding anniversary, and somebody said, why don't we trade seats and you all set together? So we got to set together coming home maybe that's a whole reason is that we needed to get the set together so we could say we sat together the whole flight I don't know but anyway but it was weary I'm gonna be honest with you we spent like eight hours <laughs> we, we we lost like four hours in the mix of all that of getting home when we thought we were gonna get to I was weary with that that'll try you sometimes won't it it'll test you it'll push you now, those are minor ways to be pushed. There's other ways that we're challenged, but that's a minor way, but needless to say, it is a way that we're challenged to have to keep the right heart, right attitude, right spirit, not to mumble and complain. The Bible says to do all things. Listen to me. Hey, if you miss anything I say this morning, don't miss this. The Bible says do all things without murmuring and disputing. Did you know that? We shouldn't mumble under our breath. We shouldn't mumble about things. We shouldn't murmur or dispute about things. That's what the Bible tells us. So those moments are moments to test us and to see that we are going to establish who God has made us to be. The reason why a weightlifter is put a lot of weight on the, on the barbells is because it is to establish the fact that he's really strong. 
And the reason why God brings things into our life that sometimes we don't like, it's not joyous, it's not fun, it's grievous, honestly. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. He even despised what was going on. There's times we despise what comes our way. Even the one who went before us, Jesus, despised the shame, but he endured the cross. God wants us to endure. Because when, when he gives that discipline against us, what it's doing, it's just simply proving out and establishing our witness and our testimony that we are who we say we are and that Jesus is who he says he is and that we're trusting that to be true. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were standing at the edge of the fiery furnace, getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace, they said, even if we die in this flame, God could deliver us, but even if he doesn't, he's still God. You know what was happening? God was establishing his witness and testimony to everybody around of who he is and the faith of those men and the one they trusted. They established their testimony as being real and being true to what they said. But they also established the reality of who God is to those watching. Do you know whatever the circumstances you are going through in life, God is seeking to establish in you the witness and the testimony and the strength and the character and and and. In all that he's made you to be, he is seeking to establish that inside of you. And that's why these things are happening. I promise you, I'm here to say, you're not going to like it all. I don't like it all. I don't like it. Some of you apparently are stronger than me because some things that God has laid against you are way heavier than what God's laid against me. So he knows there's something much bigger and much stronger in you than there is in me. But nonetheless, God is seeking to establish that in your life. So look again in verse number 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but rather, ye, but rather but, excuse me, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been, what's that next word? Those who have been trained by it. It's a training process. The discipline is there to train us, to establish in us what God wants to establish. Now, in closing, I want us to look at another passage here out of, um, out of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I want to read these verses to you. Beginning in, um, let's see. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at um, verse number 12. And it says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Here's what I want you to understand in this passage of Scripture. That God wants us to forget the things that are behind us. Listen, it's just like the person driving down the road. If their attention goes over here, then they're going to veer off. And they're going to get off path. And I want you to understand that the Bible tells us to press on toward the mark, the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And our prize is Christ Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. If I'm going to be established in my faith, I have to trust that everything he brings in my life is his perfect plan. And i got to trust him with it. doesn't mean I have to like it. 
I don't like everything. Matter of fact, when I was pressing that weight off my chest, I didn't like that person yelling at me. I want to get up and smack them at the moment. But when I finally got it up and put it on the turnstile and I got up, I wanted to hug their neck and say, thank you. I did something I didn't think I could do. That's awesome. And that's the way it is with God. Sometimes you get mad at Him in the middle of all the mess going on. I get it. We all do. But we can't lose sight of the one who loves us more than anyone else. He's a father who cares for us. And he's going to press us to establish us to be all that we're meant to be. The scripture says here in this passage that we are to press toward the goal. That means to lean into it. When it's not easy, keep going. Press yourself forward. Even when you think you can't do it, just keep going. And straining forward to what lies ahead. Press on toward the, the goal. Press on. Press on. Don't stop. Forget the things which are behind. If you focus on stuff that's behind you, it will drag you down. You know what one of my number one pet peeves are driving down the road? Is watching people drive through their rear view mirror. That drives me absolutely bonkers. You know, you're driving down the road and it's like, why do they keep looking at me? <laughs> like, look out your windshield. Quit watching me. And you know, there's obvious signs that they're doing this because they'll drop about 5, 10 miles an hour. Right? And it's like, seriously. You were doing speed limit until I got behind you and now you like slowed down 5, 10 miles an hour? And you know how you know they're looking through the rear view mirror? Because as soon as you go into the passing lane to go around them, they speed up. It's because they can't get their eyes off what's behind them. You know how many people I counsel with whose lives are all over the place? They're not going where they need to go because they can't get their eyes off of experiences and things that have happened to them in the past. And that's all they see. And as long as that's all you're looking at, you're never going to go where God wants you to go. You've got to get your eyes out of the rearview mirror and start looking out the windshield. And see that God is the author and the finisher of your faith. Not your experiences that have happened to you. I don't care. I do care. I do care what's happened to you. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to sound callous. I do care what's happened to you. And those are things you've got to work through. But at the end of the day... That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what's in front of you. And what God has for you in front of you. So where's your focus? What are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What consumes your mind? There was an experience that I went through in my life, my wife and I both. At a previous ministry. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't a happy moment. It was very trying in a lot of ways. But once we got through that, we came to Mill Road and God just like refreshed things and new things happened. It was amazing. And these things that happened there happened around us. It wasn't with us. It was around us. But when we came here, we had people that would visit from that church and come and all they could do is talk about the junk. Constantly. And I'm like, I don't want to listen to this anymore. I'm moving on. I'm past that. It's done. I don't, it's, it's over. I don't want to think about that anymore. It's not going to hold me back. I'm going forward. And I had to come to a point in a time where I had to just get away from certain people so I didn't have to listen to that all the time. So I could move on. And you know what? Satan is one that's constantly behind you going, hey, look back here. You remember those regrets? You remember those things you did? You remember all that hurt you had? You remember all the bad things people did? Don't let those things dictate where you're going. Every head bowed, never eye closed.